Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Wendy Griffith. Today, the January 6th committee submits its findings to the public. Trump oversaw and coordinated a sophisticated seven-part plan to overturn the presidential election. Get a look at what the committee presented, the Republicans' response, and what's ahead. The crisis on the southern border intensifies. Now it's more dangerous for migrants, as some are connecting with human and drug smugglers out of desperation to get here. If people need to cross, um, they'll work with less than savory uh, folks to make it happen, and that involves criminals. We'll show you the extent of the danger. The Shroud of Turin, the piece of cloth showing an image some believe is Jesus Christ, but it comes with its share of controversy. There have been questions about the veracity of this image uh, ever since its first documented uh, appearance in the late 14th century. See new technology that may finally prove the cloth's authenticity. All these stories and more are coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. Six committee presenting its findings to the public, countless subpoenas, closed door testimonies, more than 10 months and thousands of witnesses. Thursday night, the House Select Committee tasked with investigating the deadly January 6th Capitol riot presented its findings to the public. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke covered the hearings and has the latest. The January 6th committee seeks to prove the existence of a coordinated multi-level effort to overturn the 2020 presidential election and the peaceful transfer of power. During Thursday night's hearing, members made their case to the American public. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. We need backup. The committee promised never before seen video, audio, and evidence. And that included recorded testimony from former Attorney General William Barr and Trump's daughter Ivanka. Repeatedly uh, told the president in no uncertain terms uh, that uh, I did not see evidence of fraud. Uh, and uh, you know that would have affected the outcome uh, of the election. How did that affect your perspective about the election when Attorney General Barr made that statement? It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said, was saying. Two witnesses appeared before the committee Thursday night. U.S. Capitol Police Officer Caroline Edwards, injured on January 6th, and Nick Quested, a filmmaker who followed the Proud Boys while capturing the day's events. I documented the crowd turn from protesters to rioters to insurrectionists. I'm trained to detain, you know, a couple of subjects and, and handle, you know, handle a crowd, but I'm, I'm not combat trained. And that day, it was just hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat, hours of dealing with things that were way beyond any, any a law enforcement officer has ever trained it for. Republicans call the committee's findings partisan and illegitimate and held counter-program during and after the hearing to, quote, set the record straight. The entire point behind this process is to prosecute Donald Trump for crimes that he did not commit. We all know this is a sham uh, committee process. They, they want to put Donald Trump in jail. If, if they don't get that, they settle to keep his name off the ballot. GOP conference chair Elise Stefanik accused Democrats of using the hearings to try to take attention away from what's really affecting the American people. Inflation, sky-high gas prices, the border crisis, the baby formula shortage, that's what the American people care about. And Democrats know that they are losing on all of those issues because they've created their crises, their radical, radical policies. Trump made a statement ahead of the hearings saying in part that January 6th, quote, represented the greatest movement in the history of our country to make America great again. More than a handful of additional hearings are scheduled for this summer. But the question remains whether the committee's findings will do anything to change opinions or get the attention of a distracted American public. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington.
Thanks, Caitlin. In other news, the Uvalde School District Police Chief Pete Arrendondo is breaking his silence, defending the department's response to the school massacre that left 19 children and two teachers dead. He told the Texas Tribune that not a single responding officer ever hesitated, even for a moment, to put themselves at risk to save the children. He was criticized allegedly for allegedly ordering officers to not open up the classroom, but he says the officers couldn't get in because of a shielded reinforcement metal door and steel jam preventing police from entering. Chief Arendano says he called for tactical gear, a sniper, and keys to get inside. However, he says none of the keys opened the classroom door, which caused the delay. The Uvalde school shooting and other recent mass shootings have lawmakers looking at red flag laws, and the two sides could be moving toward agreement. Tara Merringer has the story from Washington. Republicans have generally rejected stricter gun control proposals, while Democrats have championed them. With the shock of Uvalde still fresh, however, a group of senators from both parties are hoping for a legislative response. It includes incentives for states that pass red flag laws. The charge led by Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. We have another Sandy Hook on our hands. And Texas Senator John Cornyn. We need to do a lot more than we have done in the past. A red flag law would permit police, family members, medical professionals and others to petition a state court to order the temporary removal of firearms from someone believed to be a danger to themselves or others. According to a recent Justice Department report, people who commit mass shootings are nearly always in a state of crisis at the time of the attack and often leak their plans. About 80 percent of mass shooters in some way broadcast their intentions in advance. They tell people they know or they talk trash on the Internet. Red flag laws already exist in 19 states. Most of those passed after the 2018 mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. The state has used the protective order nearly 9,000 times since then. Unlike most gun measures, it doesn't prevent crime. More Republicans appear open to red flag laws. There are more Republicans at the table talking about changing our gun laws and investing in mental health than at any time since Sandy Hook. In 2019, former President Trump pushed them following shootings in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. That is why I have called for red flag laws also known as extreme risk protection orders. Red flag laws have become an increasingly effective tool in preventing these shootings, as well as suicides and deadly domestic violence. Red flag law, we know those things work. Experts agree, however, they're not foolproof. New York's law did not stop a shooter from killing 10 people at a Buffalo grocery store last month. Nor, some insist, would it have stopped the Uvalde school shooter. Donnell Harvin, a senior policy researcher at Rand Corporation, says a federal gun registry would help keep people from falling through the cracks. If one state has a red flag law and an individual purchases a gun in another state and then moves to that state, um, there's no there's no there's not necessarily a, tra a trail that this individual owns a gun. So while they may be flagged as an individual who needs uh, support, maybe crisis um, type of support from a psychosocial standpoint that may not necessarily come up in any database per se that they own a gun. Research suggests red flags do make a difference. According to one study, for every 10 to 20 firearms removed in Connecticut, a life is saved. In California, there have been at least 21 cases when a red flag law disarmed people threatening mass shootings. Skeptics, though, remain on both sides, with gun rights supporters arguing they punish law-abiding people. The order has to be issued, but still, this is a gun confiscation law. And the ACLU insisting the process must be fair to those affected. Regardless, whatever gun measures the senators possibly come up with would need 60 votes to overcome a filibuster to get a vote for the bill. Meanwhile, some states, including West Virginia, maintain red flag laws will not be coming to their state. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Thanks, Tara. Crisis at the southern border. See how migrants coming in are entering dangerous territory. Stay with us.
Culberson County, Texas. It's a hub for human trafficking and drug smuggling. This remote region is uh, border sheriff Oscar Carroll. Carello's territory. CBN's Heather Sells took a ride along with the sheriff to see firsthand the extent of the crisis at our southern border. Culberson County is one of the Lone Star State's largest, three times the size of Rhode Island and with just several thousand residents. Sheriff Oscar Carrillo says he knows why the cartels have begun to exploit it. It's all about geography. It means Culberson's border proximity and interstate highway makes the county a destination route for both human and drug smuggling. We got Mexico on the south end of the county. We have New Mexico on the north end of the county. We got major corridors coming through here. This is very treacherous terrain. You've got to watch your step out here. It's hot, there's wild animals, and it's remote which is why it's become so popular with the cartels. They have no clue where they're at. They have no GPS. They have CBN News rode with Sheriff Carrillo to find out what makes the journey so dangerous. The migrants, often young men who've paid smugglers thousands, are typically dropped at the Rio Grande River. They are told to walk what could be days to a designated pickup spot along a highway. It just sounds like it's so organized. They've got a plan. To bolster their confidence before they attempt to navigate the desert, the smugglers give the migrants backpacks filled with water and cheap camouflage clothes. Still, hundreds are dying near the border each year. In 2021, the sheriff recovered 30 bodies, up from the normal one or two. The main culprits, heat and dehydration. The day we joined him, a call came for another. We're going to put it in the back of my truck. This one, some 20 miles from Van Horn, the county seat. They have just recovered this body. It was likely out here for several days. It's so far been identified as a male who was born in 1994, and he does have some identification. So the hope is that they will be able to easily uh, connect with family. He's got a, a crucifix. State law obligates the sheriff to investigate all deaths. That means examining the body and personal effects. It's a prayer. Later, on the edge of a road, Carrillo and his deputy transfer the body to an ambulance to begin the autopsy and notification of family in Guatemala. It's really also an index of desperation. El Paso-based analyst Dylan Corbett sees various reasons these migrants attempt to make it to the U.S. Worldwide, migration is up dramatically, thanks in part to the COVID pandemic. Economics and danger at home also push migrants. It's not simply that people are coming seeking a better life. It's also that people in many cases are seeking just a bare life, just bare existence. And Corbett says the broken U.S. asylum system is often driving migrants straight to the cartels. If people need to cross, um, they'll work with less than savory uh, folks to make it happen. And that involves criminals, uh, that involves human smugglers, and sometimes those folks are also connected to cartels. This is an uh, example of what we're seeing on a traffic stop. Sheriff Cardio sees the smuggling throughout his county, people crammed into vehicles or waiting on a highway for a pickup that often doesn't come. Their debris, water bottles, clothing and backpacks can be found along the road and off in the scrub. He is also beginning to see them in town. When they get to this, this area, they're out of water, they're out of money. Sometimes their plan has fallen apart. You know? Carrillo's not alone. Border Patrol has installed rescue beacons and 911 signs, hoping to provide medical help before it's too late. Still, with numbers climbing in Culberson, both for deaths and apprehensions, and questions around Title 42, Carrillo is not optimistic. We see the writing on the wall. We're experiencing it now, and uh, we're anticipating a big increase. That could also mean a very busy summer for the sheriff, his deputies, and all law enforcement here. Reporting in Culberson County, Heather Sells, CBN News. Wow, thanks, Heather. Still ahead, there's a new scientific discovery about the Shroud of Turin. See if this findings prove, uh, prove its authenticity.
Welcome back to CBN Newswatch. Is the Shroud of Turin the actual burial cloth of Jesus or a medieval forgery? It's been controversial for hundreds of years. Now, new scientific evidence gives credence to the authenticity of the Shroud. CBN's Gabe LaMonica has details. This is the story of a piece of cloth. Seen here rescued from a fire over two decades ago, surviving just the latest in a series of perils across a journey through history. The first gaze upon this mysterious relic resembles a Rorschach's test of damage dating back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Zoom in a little closer though. The stains are real blood. And the faint image of a tortured, crucified man comes into focus. Typical medieval portrayals of the crucifixion show the nails in the palms, but the palms wouldn't support the weight of the body. Look longer, and the serene face of that man becomes clear. It seems so peaceful in comparison to the violence that you see uh, all over the, the rest of the body. Brian Hyland is an exhibit curator at the Museum of the Bible. There have been questions about the veracity of this image uh, ever since its first documented uh, appearance in the late 14th century. In 1988, carbon testing dated the shroud back to medieval times. That test has repeatedly been called into question by various experts. The only single sample they took did not represent anywhere else on that cloth because it had been manipulated. Now, a new scientific procedure dates fabric from the shroud to roughly 2,000 years ago. That Italian study is just the latest in a long series of scientific testing, including studies of pollen plucked from the shroud with this scientific tape dispenser. The pollen samples that were uh, gathered, they, uh, a lot of them are from plants that are native to not just uh, the Middle East, but specifically the area around Judea, Palestine, uh, and uh, Syria, as it was in that time period. Um, there's also pollen uh, from the area around uh, Constantinople. There's a lot of pollen from Europe. The pollen samples suggest a journey of thousands of miles from Jerusalem through modern day Turkey and France and now Italy, where the artifact has been kept since the 16th century. Some say the cloth housed in the Turin Cathedral is a vessel for human blood and therefore may be nothing less than the Holy Grail. When you realize that the cloth is a vessel that's containing Christ's blood, I mean, there it is, and it is blood. And not only is it blood, it's type AB, which is the type that's consistent with Palestinian Jews. Still others call this bit of linen a forgery by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. We're saying it's a 500 year old photograph by Leonardo da Vinci. And if that doesn't sound crazy <laughs> enough, we're saying it's a 500 year old photograph of Leonardo da Vinci because he used his own face as the model, because that's the kind of thing he did. Authors Clive Prince and Lynn Picknett even put together their own experiments in an attempt to replicate the religious relic using a bust of the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius and comparing da Vinci's disputed Salvator Mundi painting to the image on the shroud. I'm no expert, but the shroud was being publicly shown 100 years before da Vinci was born. He was a good artist, but it wasn't that good. Barry Schwartz is a Jewish photographer based in Colorado who was called upon to photograph the shroud in the 70s. I was biased against it. And I even said somewhere along the line to somebody that yeah, you know, we'll get to Turin, we'll give us five minutes, we'll find the paint, we'll come home, we'll be done. Yeah, it's 44 years later. <laughs> there was no paint, and it's not a painting or an artwork. No brush strokes, and another mystery. It's 3D. Scientists using an image analyzer revealed decades ago that the lights and darks of the shroud image translate into dimensional shapes. A normal photograph records only variations in light and does not record information about the distance the camera was from the subject. Now we'll put a picture of the shroud under the camera. This image is clearly recognizable. 
This can only be explained if the intensity levels of the shroud image itself are encoded with distance information from the cloth to the body. Now, British filmmaker David Rolfe is out with his fourth film, Who Can He Be?, investigating the Shroud of Turin using the latest tech to digitally extract data encoded in the fabric, revealing a three-dimensional model of a man. We can see what I believe to be the body of the crucified Jesus in front of us on a piece of cloth whereby the only way that that image could have got onto that cloth is a miraculous one, a miracle that emanated from the body um, with unbelievable amounts of energy, but with an infinitesimally short space of time. No matter the evidence, the Shroud of Turin may always remain a mystery. But for many, this mirror of the gospel, as Pope John Paul II called it, connects them to the divine. Gabe LaMonica, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Gabe. Great story. Coming up, see a heartwarming story of a love connection 70 years in the making. Stay with us. Welcome back to CBN Newswatch. It's a story that's literally gone around the world, ending with two lovers, two states away, reconnecting after nearly 70 years. Korean War veteran Dwayne Mann fell in love with Peggy Yamaguchi when he was stationed in Japan in 1954. When he got orders to return to the States, Mann promised he'd come back. An ABC affiliate aired a story in May about Mann wanting to find Yamaguchi. It was shared around the world now Two lost loves reunited. Man calls it a freeing experience, to say the least. Love it. Well, we hope you'll join us uh, next time. We've had a great time. It's gone by fast. From all of us here at CBN News Watch, have a wonderful day, and God bless you.